Thank you for being here uh, today and welcome to this uh, 14th uh, UNU uh, wider annual lecture entitled Reforming the International Monetary and uh, Financial Architecture. I am Jean-Marc Coaco from the uh, United Nations University office here at the UN. As you know, uh, the UNU, the United Nations University, is a think tank for the UN and its member states. It is, in fact, the academic arm uh, of the UN. We are headquartered in uh, Tokyo, Japan, and we have uh, 14 uh, research and training institutes uh, located around the world. In Asia, we are present uh, in Japan, of course, where we, are, where we are headquartered, but also in China and in Malaysia. In Africa, we use uh, Accra in Ghana uh, as a hub for activities in uh, Eastern and Western Africa. Uh, in Europe, we have centers in Finland, the Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, and Iceland. And in the Americas, we are present in Canada, uh, the US, and in Venezuela. Uh, the overall theme of our work is uh, sustainability, with a special focus on international security, uh, international development, and uh, international environment. All the work that we do is policy-oriented, and we conduct this work with uh, colleagues from around the world coming from academia, of course, but also the public and private sectors at the national, regional, and uh, international levels, and also uh, uh, colleagues from, from, from NGOs, uh, from the NGO world. As for today, uh, we are very pleased to welcome uh, here with us uh, Professor Jose Antonio Ocampo for this uh, UNU wider uh, annual lecture. Uh, professor Ocampo is professor in the professional practice of international and public affairs at Columbia University, SIPA, and of course former uh, UN Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. And uh, Dr. Uh, Fintarp. Uh, our director uh, of UNU Wider, will, who is, which is based in, in Finland, uh, in ICE, in Helsinki, will introduce uh, uh, Dr. Ocampo. So uh, I don't want to, to be very long, I'll be very brief, and therefore I'll right away give the floor to uh, Professor Fintarp. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague, I should start by saying, please turn off your cell phones. But let's now get on to the really serious business. It is an absolute privilege and a great honor for me to be here today and to introduce to you Professor Jose Antonio Campo. Professor Campo will give the 14th wider annual lecture, which has become one of the main events of WIDER's annual calendar. This is really one of our sort of efforts to try to put in focus major issues on the global development agenda. And who is more appropriate to do that than Professor Ocampo? As Jean-Marc mentioned, Professor Ocampo is professor at the Columbia University, but he has had a number of really senior positions before his appointment at Columbia. He was United Nations Undersecretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. He was the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC. He was the Minister of Finance and Public Credit, Chairman of the Board of the Banco del Republica. He was Director of National Planning in the Ministry of Planning. He was a Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development and many other senior positions. Indeed, a distinguished career, both on the academic side, on the policy side, within the UN. In addition to that, Jose Antonio Campo is a great colleague. He is the author of numerous books and articles on macroeconomic policy and theory, economic development, international trade and economic history, and his latest books include Growth and Policy in Developing Countries, A Structuralist Approach, Will Lance Taylor and Kudrin Arada, and Time for a Visible Hand, Lessons from the 2008 World Financial Crisis with Stephanie Griffiths-Jones and Joe Stieglitz. I think these titles suggest 
That Ocampo is at the front line of the core debates about the international financial and monetary architecture. Would you kindly join me in welcoming Professor Ocampo today? Let me um, thank uh, Finn, uh, Finn Tarr for this uh, kind invitation to deliver this uh, 14th annual uh, wider lecture. Uh, let me say, let me start by saying uh, how important the work of this uh, Institute of the United Nations University, uh, wider, <clears throat> uh, the very important role that it has played uh, in, uh, in development and in the work of the United Nations. Uh, I can say that um, both in uh, the, my academic career, my early life, uh, uh, and my current life, as well as in the intermediate period in which uh, I was a, a UN official, I had the, uh, the opportunity to work very closely uh, with WIDER. Uh, the early years of uh, WIDER uh, made it uh, a, a very respectable meeting place for uh, academics uh, working uh, on development issues. Uh, and, uh, and it has remained like that. I think the record uh, of publications, uh, excellent meetings, and support to the United Nations debates uh, that is in the record of why they make it really a, a unique institution uh, within the United uh, Nations family. I'd like to underscore, uh, you know, in particular, two things that I find uh, very interesting about the history of wider. The first uh, is the uh, uh, the pluralism that ca has characterized the work of, uh, of WIDER. Uh, you can see there uh, uh, different approaches to, uh, to development debates uh, through the years, just by looking at the, uh, at the list of people who have preceded me in this, uh, in this podium, you can see the, the plurality uh, of, uh, of views uh, that uh, can be expressed through this uh, institution very much in the, uh, in the spirit of the United Nations. And second, and, and equally important, uh, the capacity of WIDER to convene not only researchers from uh, industrial countries on development issues, but even more so, researchers from the developing countries. I had the opportunity to meet many people uh, from the, uh, the start of WIDER uh, 25 years ago in the, in the WIDER meetings, uh, in which uh, I had the opportunity to meet, you know, many Latin Americans, Africans, uh, Asians, uh, with whom I have the opportunity to interact through the years. Uh, I also uh, uh, really honor and uh, privilege, uh, and I must add proud, uh, to be able to uh, deliver uh, this lecture today uh, after the uh, so many uh, uh, you know, brilliant economists who have preceded me in this podium. So thank you, Fintar, for this invitation today. I'm going to, do, to talk today uh, about the, um, the uh, uh, monetary and financial uh, architecture. Uh, and uh, I must say in particular uh, about the monetary part, as, as you will see, since the financial part has uh, been subject to, uh, uh, to more debate. And this is a, actually a, quite a, a very interesting time uh, it is quite clear that this crisis uh, has not finished. Just if you read the papers today, you will see that the, uh, there was a, a run on government bonds worldwide yesterday. So, which is a, a, a one of the many reflections, uh, uh, as well as the events in, uh, in Europe and in many other parts, that we are still living through the effects uh, of this crisis that started, let's say, in. Uh, uh, mid-2007, uh, so we have more than three years going on. And as I will try to show, uh, as, the prices, as the crisis has proceeded, uh, more and more issues have been put uh, in, the, uh, in the agenda. So let me start, let me divide the presentation in three parts. I'll, I'll start with the context. Uh, then I will talk about the substantive issues of the reform agenda, uh, and, and finally about the governance issues. Uh, which are equally important for, uh, for, the, for this purpose. So on the context, uh, let me, of course, start by underscoring the uh, fundamental fact that the, this crisis uh, 
uh, has revealed again, I would say, that we have a dysfunctional uh, a monetary and financial uh, governance. That the, uh, the rules on which uh, financial globalization is taking place uh, are inadequate for the magnitude of the inter interaction uh, among countries that takes place in the current global era. But this is not the first time we're discussing this. Uh, actually, after the Asian crisis, but you can say even before after Latin American uh, debt crisis, or even before, after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in 1971, the issues uh, of the uh, reform uh, of the international monetary and financial system have been on the agenda. And, and the fact is that there has been little action. Actually, my, my own contact with this issue that I'm uh, going to talk today came uh, precisely in my early days in the United Nations, when the, um, when the uh, the group of UN uh, institutions got together uh, to propose uh, actually an agenda for international monetary and financial reform that was put out actually in January of 1999. And I, I was given the task of coordinating that job. So at that time, many of the issues that I'm going to talk today were clearly in the agenda. And the UN was uh, one of the um, institutions that uh, pioneered many issues that only with time it have been recognized uh, as central to the reform effort. So I must say that, uh, uh, you know, I think the United Nations, and I'll come back to this at the end, uh, must have a place in this dialogue, uh, and a place that uh, sometimes has been recognized, uh, for instance, and most notably in the Monterey Conference on Financing for Development, uh, but, uh, or last year in the uh, summit that took place uh, in June uh, on, the on the global crisis, but which uh, sometimes is not clear recognized by all actors. So I think this is a, a very important issue that I want to discuss. So the Asian crisis in particular generated a, a set of uh, many, uh, you know, very important initiatives, but many, uh, or, or I said most, uh, were not materialized into action. Now, so this is an opportunity to, uh, to uh, 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 describe the fact that the industrial uh, countries have been at the center of the crisis. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to rethink seriously uh, this uh, whole uh, architecture. Now, when you think of this issue, uh, there are two uh, clear uh, overriding objectives. The, the first one is the objective of macroeconomic stability. Uh, in the world in which we live, which is a, a world, uh, or it's an international system, that is, it's a, it's a system which still relies on nation states, and which nation states are the main actor in economic policy, the main task is to, you know, to give some level of coherence uh, to policies that are adopted at the national level. So that's the main task of macroeconomic stability, and of course, the capacity to prevent crisis and to, uh, and to manage crisis when they occur uh, that uh, threaten that uh, monetary uh, stability. And the second is financial stability, which is, a, in a sense, you can think of as a subset of the macro issue. But this relates in particular uh, to the uh, financial system. Uh, now, in the history of this that I, I will present very briefly, it is quite clear that in the design of the uh, global institutions uh, after the Second World War, uh, it was monetary stability that prevailed and, and where there was a more copious architecture that was put in place, in particular through the creation of the International Monetary Fund. Financial stability, in contrast, uh, was received very little attention, in fact, no attention. And this was, of course, no accident because the international financial system has essen had essentially disappeared uh, during the uh, crisis of the 1930s. So the Great Depression actually uh, eliminated uh, financial globalization. And it would only take, you know, it would take a, you know, three or four decades for a, an international uh, financial system to come back into existence. So it was only in the 1970s that you can think that the issue of uh, how to regulate or how to manage financial globalization was first put in the agenda with a significant lag, essentially because the main uh, 
uh, or the, the, uh, the, uh, the development of this, uh, what is called the Euro dollar market in, Euro in uh, Europe, of course, and the uh, later uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the Euro currencies market, uh, you know, had only really uh, taken off in the 1960s. So it was only in the 1970s that this issue was recognized. Now the two, of course, are closely uh, linked uh, and we know that because uh, you know, most of the macroeconomic instability uh, is associated with crisis in the financial system. Uh, as we know, uh, the, uh, uh, we are living through uh, one such uh, occurrence, but there have been many, many more in the past, uh, even before, of course, the creation uh, of the institutions that have been uh, designed to, to do that. What is interesting about the, the way the crisis has evolved is that uh, the, the, the agenda has uh, increasingly broadened. Um, when you think of the initial crisis, and, and particularly the, uh, the financial meltdown that took place in the world uh, after the uh, collapse of Lehman Brothers in September of 2008, uh, you know, that led to, uh, to these uh, actions uh, under the leadership of the Group of 20 uh, to uh, re-regulate finance, uh, so there's been a lot of effort to do that, uh, but also to, uh, uh, to revive a, a, an instrument of international cooperation that was in, uh, undergoing a deep crisis, which was the International Monetary Fund, uh, including uh, not only the creation of credit lines, uh, many credit lines as we will see, but uh, also uh, the revival of this very peculiar uh, institution uh, that uh, on which I will focus a lot of attention later on, which is this special drawing rights. The special drawing rights um, is, um, is a funny name, I would say, for, uh, for the only international money that we have. Um, it's actually a, a money that can only be used, let's say, by, uh, by central banks, and in the dealings of central banks with the IMF. Uh, but it's not uh, used uh, broadly, it's not used in private markets, uh, but it's an international money created by the IMF uh, the same way, in a sense, that central banks create money at the national level. Uh, and I think that, uh, as you will see, one of my main uh, focus is how to make that international money more useful for uh, the uh, international monetary system. And I think that's a great part of the reform agenda that has to be uh, 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 analyzed. Now, in the, in the most recent uh, uh, second phase that uh, is of more recent origin, uh, uh, which is the one that took place a few months ago, uh, there was this talk about, about the currency wars, the term uh, that was uh, used by the Brazilian finance minister to refer uh, to this uh, you know, volatility of currencies, to the flood of money towards emerging markets that is taking place and the exchange rate problems that they have been creating in developing countries. That is the tendency to excessive appreciation uh, of the currencies of developing countries. Now, that brought into the, into the light the, the need to, to do more things, uh, particularly uh, it, the need to correct uh, current account imbalances, that is the balance of payments of countries, uh, which was the subject of the debate in the last meetings of the IMF and the last meeting of the Group 20 in Seoul. But also uh, uh, brought into light uh, the issue that, you know, maybe we also need to regulate more the capital flows uh, across countries because it's a very peculiar issue that the G20 took the, 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 uh, the, uh, the re regulation of finance in a very serious manner, but the regulation of cross-border finance, let's say, the, that take place across borders, is an issue that has not been in the agenda of the Group of 20. So I think the, the, this currency wars uh, uh, brought the fact that uh, you have a problem with the exchange rates and you have a problem with capital flows across countries. Now you have, in addition, the, uh, the crisis of the European periphery and the many debates that have taken place uh, around that crisis, which have brought into the agenda at least two other issues. The first is the issue of the importance of regional institutions. Because the, the Europeans finally reacted with creating a stronger regional institution to help manage uh, the financial system. I'll come back to this issue. 
And also, and very importantly, brought back an issue that had been in the agenda repeatedly, but which is subject to a repeated amnesia also, which is the issue of how to manage over indebtedness of countries. How to restructure, reschedule debts of countries uh, when they have gone into crisis. So this issue, which has been in the center of the European debates, also was discussed in the IMF in the 2001-2003 uh, under the um, lead, uh, proposals made by the uh, IMF at the time. But it had been in the agenda before, uh, after the Mexican crisis of 1994. So it's a repeated issue that you know, has come into the agenda. In a sense, the fact that the world does not have a, an international bankruptcy court. Bankruptcies uh, and the management of bankruptcies is, a, is, a, is part of market economies. So you need mechanisms, institutional mechanisms, to analyze and to manage bankruptcies. Well, that doesn't exist at the international level, which is the problem that is, again, put in the agenda uh, during the, Europe, uh, the crisis. And then, finally, and very important, there is the issue of global monetary reform as such. This issue was put in the agenda uh, in March of last year by the Chinese Central Bank Governor, uh, and also by, by this commission convened uh, by the President of the General Assembly of the United Nations on International Monetary and Financial Issues that was headed by Professor Stiglitz, of which I was a member, uh, and, and which put in the agenda the issue that global monetary reform, that is the role of international money versus national monies, it has to be also a, a, a very important issue to discuss. Uh, and it's very interesting that this is the topic that the French presidency of the Group of 20 has put at the center of its agenda for next year. So there are going to be a series of meetings uh, to discuss exactly uh, this issue of international monetary reform. Now, if you think of, of, of the history of it, uh, it's very interesting because then you can see the, uh, the elements of what uh, came into being and, and what is being, uh, I mean, what are the main elements of the international monetary architecture that we have. The debate started, of course, during the Second World War and, uh, and in particularly uh, in the uh, meetings that, uh, among the United States and the United Kingdom uh, that uh, finally led to the creation of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank at Bretton Woods. Now, the, the proposal that was put in the agenda by, by Keynes at the time, in the name of the UK, was that uh, the essential problem of the international monetary system is the fact that it places the whole burden of, of adjustment during crisis on deficit countries. So deficit countries have to adjust. Surplus countries do not have to adjust. And that asymmetry is an essential problem in the international monetary system. I mean, you can see it today. I mean, this is why Greece and Ireland have to adjust in Europe, but Germany, the surplus country, does not. Okay? So that is exactly the problem that, is, you know, that comes back repeatedly in the, in, during crisis. And so, Mr. Keynes, in the name of the UK, proposed the creation of what he called an international clearing, clearing union, which was essentially a, a sort of, you know, central bank of the world, I mean, to, some, to simplify, uh, that uh, uh, in which surplus countries uh, would be forced uh, to finance the deficits of deficit countries. Uh, so as to allow a, a smooth adjustment and, and, and to put part of the burden uh, on surplus countries. Now, Mr. Harry Dexter White, the U.S. negotiator, uh, of course said you know, no to that idea for one simple reason, because it was clear that after the Second World War, with the destruction of Europe, the only surplus, major surplus country in the world was going to be the United States. So that meant that the United States would have to uh, essentially finance in an unlimited manner the European deficit. So th that discussion uh, between the two positions is what led to the creation of the uh, International Monetary Fund. And let me see what are the, uh, uh, the essential characteristics of that arrangement. I, I will summarize in five features. The first is that uh, the, uh, there was a global monetary system or global reserve system, as, as it is called, uh, 
based uh, on a dual uh, monetary uh, standard, the dollar and the gold, okay? With the dollar tied, uh, excuse me, dollar uh, ties to gold at a fixed part. The second uh, was a system of fixed exchange rates uh, that could, however, be adjusted uh, when there was disequilibrium in the payments of countries. It's interesting that it was fixed exchange rates, not floating exchange rates that we had later on, for one simple reason, because the 1930s had been a period of a lot of for, uh, floating exchange rates, and there was a sense that there, were, there had been a lot of competitive devaluation, that countries have used monies to uh, gain a comparative advantage in uh, international trade. And for that reason, floating or flexible exchange rates were seen actu actually as a bad idea to design an international monetary system. And that's why the system was based on fixed exchange rates, but that could be adjusted. So it would not be like in the gold standard uh, that had prevailed up, up to the First World War, in which countries could not change their parties uh, among each other. So it was a, part a partially flexible system, but essentially based on fixed exchange rates. The third element of that uh, reform was that you, any country could control in any way it saw fit the capital movements. So that there was no free capital movement. And for what reason? Basically because that will increase the capacity of countries uh, to uh, manage their monetary policies. So that was the third element of the system. Capital controls in any way uh, any country wanted and actually the, you know, outside the United States, uh, the major uh, 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 part of the world economy, uh, you know, they say, uh, Western Europe, used capital controls extensively uh, up to 1990. So it was a long period in which they actually used capital controls in an extensive way. Uh, even the United States used uh, capital controls at several, you know, periods in history, you know, that are now a bit forgotten, but, you know, the. Uh, President Nixon, for instance, in, uh, established a, a very uh, interesting, uh, you know, what they call interest equalization tax, uh, which is not unlike the, what the Brazilians are doing today when they put a, a tax on capital inflows. You know? So it's actually a, a very similar system uh, also used by the United States. The third, uh, excuse me, the fourth element is that during crisis, since countries uh, will uh, in crisis would, unlike, would be unlikely to have access to capital markets, then uh, there would be some limited financing by the IMF. Okay, so that you know, emergency financing was part of the system. And finally, there was a, a, there was a mechanism for macroeconomic policy coordination, which was very loose. Uh, it included this uh, uh, monitoring of, uh, of a country's policy to the IMF, uh, but no real macroeconomic policy coordination. Now, this system collapsed in 1971 uh, when the United States decided to abandon the parity uh, 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 with gold that had uh, been established at Bretton Woods. And then we had a different arrangement that arose which uh, has many, many different features from the system that was in place before. And this is essentially the system that we have today. So the first one is that the center of the system uh, will be a totally inconvertible currency, the United States dollar. Now, in, now with no conversion for gold as in the old system. So an inconvertible currency was at the center of the system. The second is that countries were allowed to use about any exchange rate system they wanted, so the, the fixed exchange rate system was abandoned altogether. And actually, among the major currencies, the system that has prevailed is a system of flexible exchange rates. So in a sense, back to the 30s, rather than to Bretton Woods, okay? This is, of course, the basic problem because it, uh, as in the 1930s, and, and this is why the decisions in the IMF about how to manage exchange rates have always pointed out that, they have to, uh, that countries have to avoid manipulating their exchange rate to increase competitiveness, okay? And this is a subject of a lot of debate. This is, a, this is the center of the debate on the currency wars, about whether countries are actually manipulating the, uh, their exchange rates under the current system. That is the same debate of the 1930s that eventually led uh, 
to the abandonment, abandonment of uh, flexible exchange rates. The third is that although it was never decided, actually when the US and the IMF tried to uh, establish uh, free capital movements uh, in the Hong Kong meetings of the IMF uh, in 1997, uh, they were defeated. So the, essentially, in principle, countries can, can still uh, manage their capital flows as much as, you know, and control them as much as they want. Uh, in practice, by the pressure of markets and even by the pressure of conditionality uh, in the IMF programs uh, and even the World Bank programs, uh, countries have ended up, you know, uh, with a significant level of capital account liberalization. The fourth is that the uh, idea of emergency financing continued to be in place, but the size of the IMF became increasingly small relatively to the demands generated precisely by the mobility of capital. So we have a system uh, in which uh, you know, there, there, there are credit lines, uh, but they were seen as increasingly insufficient for a world in which there is much more capital movement than before. This is the issue that came uh, with very strong force uh, during the Asian crisis and came again during this recent crisis, leading to a significant reform uh, of these credit lines uh, of the IMF. And finally, the, the, uh, the fifth element of this arrangement is some limited macroeconomic policy coordination but that take place outside the IMF through a mechanism that uh, I call elite multilateralism. So the leading countries decide to organize themselves uh, uh, you know, outside formal uh, frameworks, uh, first in the G7, now in the G20, but that take place outside the formal institutions. That's why, uh, because they are the leading countries, I call them elite multilateralism. So elite multilateralism has actually been the way macroeconomic uh, coordination has taken place. And you can think of several phases in history. Uh, it took place during the early post-war period when you have uh, the problem that was then called the dollar shortage, the fact that you know, dollars were scarce, uh, given the, uh, uh, the need of Europe to reconstruct itself, the fact that Japan was still a developing country, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that was solved in a bilateral way through Marshall Plan, okay, outside the IMF and outside the World Bank, which had actually been created largely to finance the reconstruction of Europe, and that's why it's called the, you know, the Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the reconstruction part, referring to Europe uh, in the case of the World Bank. The second uh, was the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, of this dull color party in 1971. That itself, again, was uh, managed outside the, um, the IMF through uh, what was called the Smithsonian Agreement. Uh, which is named, in the case it was signed in Washington, okay? Among the group of 10, which was a, in let's say, group of seven plus uh, three smaller uh, European countries that are very important for um, uh, financial issues. Then we had the, the crisis of the 1980s generated by the excessive appreciation of the dollar uh, in the first part of the 80s uh, that led to these uh, two accords, the, the PLAS Accord, signed in New York, and the Louvre Accord, signed, of course, in Louvre, uh, to manage the, uh, uh, an orderly depreciation of the dollar, and very importantly, an appreciation of the yen, uh, which is uh, why the, uh, you know, so the Japan was, in a sense, forced to appreciate this currency, which is a, a very important precedent of why China doesn't want to follow that step, because many analysts, including me, considered that that was the end of the Japanese boom, uh, that accord. Uh, and, and that's why China doesn't, in a sense, want to go that way uh, in its current uh, dealings uh, of its uh, currency problems. And finally, uh, Europe itself manages problems outside uh, the IMF, of course, building at the end its own institutions. So in the post-war period, there was this uh, 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 European, month, uh, well, excuse me, the, um, the, the creation of a European payments union uh, and then after the collapse of, uh, of the uh, fixed, uh, fixed parities in 1971, there was the creation of the European monetary system to manage the problems of uh, fluctuations. Now, a characteristic of Europe is that it never accepted among its members a flexible exchange rate system. 
So they eventually said they had limitations on flexibility that eventually led to the creation of a unique currency among most of the countries. Uh, and this is very important because this could be, in a sense, one way in which the exchange rate system of the world can be redesigned in something similar to the, what was called in the early 1970s the SNEAK. So it's a sort of flexible, but you know, uh, flexibility within some uh, uh, constraints that was uh, arranged about uh, 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 European currencies. Okay, let me skip this global financial stability to go into the second part of the lecture, which is what is uh, that uh, we think, well, I think, should be the design of the system, okay? And, and I call this comprehensive yet evolutionary reform because what I think the, what is characteristic of the system that we're living through is that the seeds of reform are coming from inside. So there are many things that have been done or are being done on which we could be built a, a very different system. And that's what, in a sense, my proposals uh, are here. And that's why I think they are realistic because they are, they come from things that countries are already doing. And I think that's uh, what is, uh, I think, interesting about this proposal. So for that you need, you know, in a sense, relating to the, func the functions of, uh, of the international monetary system, you, you need five essential elements which I want to focus in, you know, gradually in my presentation. The first, you, you need a system to make national policies consistent among each other, okay? So, so that they contribute to global macroeconomic stability um, uh, and, uh, and, don't, and particularly avoid uh, this problem of, let's say, of uh, competition through exchange rates, uh, the, uh, that is, they avoid the currency wars, okay? Second, you, you need an international monetary system that contributes to uh, world stability and that is seen by, as fair by all the parties. Third, you need regulation of capital flows across countries of some sort as part of the global regulatory reform. Fourth, you need to improve the emergency financing during crisis. And finally, you need a, an international debt workout mechanism that is a, a mechanism to manage a crisis of sovereign countries. So let me see what this means in practice. In the first area, that is the area of macroeconomic policy, my, in a sense, my simple proposal is bring the issue back to the IMF, not to the G20. So in a sense, the G20 should give back this function, which is a fundamental function of the IMF. Uh, and in a sense, replace elite multilateralism by some form of uh, formal multilateralism in the IMF that may have some deficiencies that we have to improve on, but which is, a, 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 at the end, a system in which all countries have a voice, you know, through the constituency on which the uh, board of the IMF is formed. There have been inter interesting precedents of this, and actually the most important precedent was precisely the creation of this international money, the, uh, the special drawing rights in the 1960s, which is interesting because it started as initiative of Europe outside the IMF, and the United States insisted that it be discussed within the, the IMF. And it finally was approved with it within the IMF. And, uh, uh, and why? Because the U actually the US saw that developing countries uh, were an interesting partner in the debate vis-a-vis -vis Europe. And, and that's why the special drawing rights was the major monetary decision of the world that, was, that has taken place within the IMF itself. There was also this attempt in 2006 to manage uh, multilateral surveillance uh, uh, through the IMF, which was a failure. Uh, and now in the, in the, under the G20, uh, uh, you have this mechanism with, by, by the IMF uh, is uh, assist the, 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 the so-called consultative Mutual, a mutual assessment process of the G20. So the, uh, which uh, is a, a very peculiar arrangement in, in, uh, in the sort because uh, it's a, a, a formal multilateral institution at the service of elite multilateralism, which is not quite uh, the best principle of uh, international cooperation that we can think of, okay? So that's why I think the, the, the best way to do this is to just leave it, you know, give the IMF the function of multilateral consultations uh, in macroeconomic policy. 
And there's, of course, there was uh, the, um, the broader revival of the IMF uh, with the return of industrial country borrowing. You know, industrial countries had not borrowed from the IMF since the early 1970s, so this was a, a very important event. Uh, and uh, very interestingly, uh, the, uh, the more recent decisions, which was uh, the decision to double uh, the, uh, uh, well, to, to make the issuance of a special drawing rights, which is the largest in history, $283 billion last year, and the doubling of quotas, which was agreed just prior uh, to the G20, uh, uh, to the recent G20. So that's my proposal. You know, let's continue with the way it has been, in a sense, built by the G20, but within the IMF, which is the, 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 the best forum for that purpose. Now, the global reserve system, which is, you know, what is the international money and the relation between the international money and the national monies, or regional monies in the case of the euro, uh, is, of course, the center, the second problem uh, of reform. And that uh, requires, uh, you know, uh, three uh, sort of reforms. To manage uh, three problems that the system has. The first is the, 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 the problem that was highlighted by Keynes in the debates um, during the Second World War. Uh, that's why I call it the anti-Keynesian bias. The fact that the, the burden of adjustment is on deficit countries. In other words, that surplus countries don't have, uh, you know, much to adjust a significant role. So you have to give some role to the surplus countries in the adjustment process also. The second is uh, the, uh, what is, has co to, uh, come to be called the Triffin Dilemma. Now, the Triffin Dilemma is on, in, in honor of a famous Belgian economist, uh, uh, Robert Triffin, or Robert Traffan, uh, that, um, uh, uh, made uh, uh, the most insightful analysis uh, of the, how the dollar uh, gold system work uh, back in you know, his writings in 1959. And the, the essential problem he's highlighted is that when you use a national currency, that is the US dollar, as the international currency, you have a problem. Why do you have a problem? Because in order to give international liquidity, that is to give dollars to the world, the U.S. has to incur a deficit, okay? But the fact that the U.S. incurs a deficit at the end may defeat the expectations of stability of the dollar. So in a sense, the system by which you provide international liquidity is a system that makes the central currency unstable, okay? That's essentially the point that uh, was made by Robert Triffin. And that's why he proposed that the system had to evolve into an international money which in a sense was the debate of the 1960s and that led to the creation to the special drawing rights. You know? So that's the, the second problem of the system and we'll see some features uh, uh, shortly. And the third problem is what I call the growing inequities of the system. Now, where do the growing inequities arise? They arise essentially because developing countries are subject to much more volatility in the international monetary system than the countries at the center, at least historically. This is still true today, because despite that, you know, the fact that the United States has been at the center of the crisis, when there is a, a significant flight to quality, as it is current in this debate, money comes to the U.S. So the U.S. has, in a sense, no financing problem so far, okay? I mean, and hopefully never, <laughs> because that will be a major collapse of the international system. But the countries, in the, uh, the countries that have some payments problems at different stages do have a problem of instability. And capital flows have been very unstable for all developing countries uh, in recent decades. How did the countries respond? Developing countries, they responded basically by accumulated foreign exchange reserves, by a mechanism that is, has come to be called self-insurance. So see, there is no good collective insurance in the world lest each one of us accumulate reserves to protect ourselves against Christ. That system actually has worked in one sense. It has worked in that it has allowed developing countries to manage this recent crisis much better than before because they have a huge amount of reserves to protect themselves. But of course it has a problem is that in that effort by itself generates uh, payments imbalances, okay? So you have to, to see how to manage the uh, the, the, the individual rationality of the system, 
for each country, but the collective irrationality of the system, which is what you know we in economics, in economics call the fallacy of composition. So this is a thing that is good for one person or one country, but that may be bad if everyone does that at the same time. I mean, the best case is actually the case of consumers. I mean, you know, which is the basic fallacy of composition. You know, it's good for, you know, for one consumer, it may be good to save more. But if all consumers save more, then we have a problem of demand. And we have a crisis, okay? So this is, in a sense, the same. Uh, the same problem, but at the, at the international level. If each developing country accumulates reserves, it's good for that country. But if all countries are accumulating reserves at the same time, we have a problem. Because someone has to be on the other side. So someone has to be uh, uh, having a deficit to compensate for the surpluses uh, that countries have. And here are some, some of the, the uh, manifestations. I mean, just see the, uh, these are the dollar exchange rate in, in red and the, in the deficit of the United States. You see that the system has been characterized by increasing deficits and a, cre and a large volatility of the central currency, which is the US dollar. And this is what has happened to reserves. You see, back you know, 20 years ago, developing countries and industrial countries had the same amount of reserves, of international reserves, about 3% of GDP, of gross domestic product. But you see, since the crisis, in the Latin American debt crisis, and particularly since the Asian crisis, developing countries reacted by accumulating lots of reserves, okay? So that, uh, you know, uh, the industrial countries in the bottom, except for Japan, uh, continue to have about 3% of GDP. But now a typical uh, middle-income country has about 30% of reserves, and a typical low-income country is 25% of reserves, uh, of GDP in reserves. So that developing countries on a massive scale have been self-protecting themselves, okay? So, uh, which is, uh, this is, of course, a, you know, good in the sense that Developing countries have been able to manage crisis better, but it's bad, and why is bad? Essentially because uh, it implies that the U.S. has to run a deficit in order to be for the countries, for developing countries as a group, uh, to uh, run a, a, a surplus, which is what you know how you accumulate reserves. But then, then this become this became a problem because the United States deficit became a problem by itself. So this is part of the, of the irrationality uh, that we have in the system. Now, during this crisis, it's interesting. You see the countries, developing countries, use part of the reserves, but then they started to accumulate uh, reserves again. So we are now, since mi the middle of last year, in another phase of reserve accumulation, uh, which is a, a natural response by developing countries to the, a system in which now capital are flowing again in massive quantities to developing countries, generating up, you know, a, a appreciation of their exchange rates, uh, which they want to avoid because they know that from the past that every time their exchange rate appreciates and they run deficits, they are likely to have a crisis, which is a, a, a repeated history uh, that has to be uh, correct. That's why the, the system has to be um, uh, resolved, and, and there are, in a sense, two alternatives. The, the alternative, the initial alternative, uh, is what we can call a multi-currency standard. That is a, a standard based not on one cur national currency, but on several national currencies, which aside, I guess, from the US dollar, uh, could be the euro in particular, it could be the yuan, uh, you know, very soon, and the, and, the Jap and the Chinese authorities are really working for that, that the yuan would be used as an international currency. I mean, I can think of, in, in a smaller scale, other currencies. Now, that system has several advantages. It's more diversified, so that, you know, it's less prone to, to individual currency crisis. Uh, that's, that's good. But it is equally uh, in, um, inequitable, because still the developing countries with the exception of China, I guess, if the China becomes part of that system, it, it, the developing countries will still have to uh, accumulate reserves to manage their crisis. And, and, and we must remember that, you know, reserve, what is a reserve? When, where do countries invest reserves? They basically, base, they basically buy U.S. Treasury bonds or, or German Treasury bonds. So it's a capital flow towards the industrial countries. That's exactly what a reserve is. 
So it's a money that is invested by developing countries in industrial countries, by developing countries central banks. So it's a system is inequitable in a sense the developing countries under this system is giving cheap financing to the U.S. and to other industrial countries. That's essentially what the reserve accumulation implies, I know, at the world level. So that, that's why the, uh, the, the other alternative that I propose is a system essentially based on a special drawing rights. So it's, it's to make the IMF more like a central bank of the world uh, it, with the capacity to create money on a larger scale to create, uh, like he did last year when he created $283 billion uh, in um, international money, in special drawing rights, but in which those, uh, that international money can itself be used by the fund to finance crisis managed, to finance crisis. Okay? So, and uh, how do I propose uh, this in a very simple way? Countries are issued a special drawing right. So, you know, any all members of the IMF are given by the IMF this international money, which is uh, owned by the central banks of the, of the, of the whole world. And, they, and then, if they don't use that money, they, de in a sense, deposit it, quote unquote, in the IMF. So, they see like accounts, deposit accounts of the central banks. And with those deposits, the IMF will be able to lend, right? Will be able to lend to countries. Uh, in difficulties. So you have a self-financing mechanism which is actually what all central banks of the world do. When you think of the discussions on the, on the U.S. monetary policy, that's exactly the point. How does the, uh, the, the, uh, the, how does the, the, the Federal Reserve create money? Basically, it lends to the U.S. government, it buys treasury bonds, or it, you know, buys you know, uh, other private bonds in the market. So in a sense, it's a, self, it's a mechanism of financing. So the creation of money of a modern central bank is a mechanism of financing. Okay, that's exactly what I'm proposing for the IMF. Use a special drawing rights. In a sense, uh, uh, go into an entirely uh, uh, IMF based on a special drawing rights and use those issuance of special rights as the main financing mechanism of the IMF. Now, in that system, you will have to correct certain asymmetries, and particularly this basic problem that is developing countries that need reserves, not industrial countries. I mean, one of the basic anomalies uh, of a special drawing rights is that you, you, you know, you, I mean, last year, for instance, about 60% of the, uh, of the special drawing rights were given to industrial countries, including the U.S., which don't need it. While developing countries, which are the ones that do demand huge amounts of research for protection are only giving 40% uh, of, the, of, the, of the special drawing rights. So I say, well, let's think about different ways. And I propose in particular two ways. Uh, the first one is that you uh, have an asymmetric issuance. So essentially, you give, well, for instance, you, you decide that, uh, which is something proposal by, by a colleague, uh, John Williamson that give, let's say, 20% of the issuance to uh, industrial countries and 80% to developing countries, and then uh, just allocate that, those proportions according to the IMF quotas in the IMF of each group, of each country within its group. Let's say one way. So it's an asymmetric issuance, give more of the special drawing rights to the countries that really demand reserves, which are developing countries. That's one proposal. But the other proposal is uh, what I call a development link uh, which is similar to a proposal that was made by a group of eminent economists to UNCTAD in the 1960s when the discussion of a special drawing rights was taking place, which is, would essentially be the following. Let the IMF, with the deposits of a special drawing rights, buy or deposit that money or lend that money to the World Bank and the other development banks. Okay? So one of the possible uses of a special drawing rights is actually lending by the IMF to the World Bank, to the Inter-American Development Bank, to the Asian, to the African Development Bank. And with that, that means that you know, that money would be recycled into developing countries uh, through those uh, development banks. So that's my second proposal. So there's two alternatives. And this is actually the proposal that was adopted by the Stiglitz Commission uh, last year. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the second element of the system. Now the third element, and I would say the more difficult is the exchange rate problems. So to start with, let me say that we don't have a system of exchange rates. That's why I say we really have a non-system of exchange rates. But essentially, any country can choose any uh, uh, exchange rate system. You can choose a floating exchange rate system, but you can you know, fix your exchange rate. For instance, floating is the US versus the Euro. Uh, but you can also do the um, fixed exchange rates, uh, Hong Kong versus the US dollar, totally fixed. Uh, exchange rate, uh, or you can have intermediate systems, you know. You can put bands, which will, you allow your currency to float. You can have the old system, which have fixed exchange rate, and then manage, uh, uh, move it uh, during crisis, etc. So any country can adopt any system, which is a non-system, a lack of a system, right? And, and I think that is a, what is proving to be a, a problem particularly because uh, the accusation that is ma being manipulated by countries uh, has come at the center of the problem uh, with, of course, the significant uh, views about whether countries are manipulating their currencies or not. Let's say, let's talk about the, uh, the, the problem of the Chinese uh, uh, yuan uh, to be uh, the major problem of that time. But even more important, the, the system has two basic problems. First of all, it's not contributing to correcting global imbalances. I mean, that's quite clear by the facts. It's not correcting global imbalances today. But equally importantly, it's very dysfunctional for world trade. So what you have is very, very, a lot of unstable exchange rates, and the instability of exchange rate is a tax on trade. I mean, you can think of it. It's a tax on international trade. Actually, that's what I learned uh, when I was a student of economics, reading you know, a very famous economist, uh, Charles Kinderberger, uh, who actually referred to flexible exchange rates as a tax on international trade. And that's why Europe never liked flexible exchange rate among its members. Because they know that you know, when you have flexible exchange rate, you cannot have a stable trade. And that's why you know, European integration was obsessed with avoiding huge fluctuations of exchange rates. And that's why they intervened so heavily and invented many ways of avoiding a, a flotation of exchanges. So we need a basic reform of the system, uh, which can have two elements. The, the, the first one is actually uh, what was agreed by the G20 uh, in Seoul, uh, which is let's, let's talk about some indicative uh, targets uh, on the current account. So avoid countries from running large surpluses or large deficits in trade. Okay? That's one, that's one way to proceed. That's part of the solution, I think, to this. But the other is the proposal that have come repeatedly through the years, which is to adopt something like the European monetary system. Okay? So a system that allows for some flexibility, but within certain constraint bounds, which is the system that has been called in different ways uh, target zones uh, uh, in, uh, by some or reference rate by others. So let's think of, of a system that is less flexible, is still flexible, but does not allow the volatility. And I, I think you know, that this is a problem is shown here. Uh, this, is the, this is the volatility of the uh, exchange rate between the dollar and the euro. Okay? And you can see here that since Lehman Brothers, we have had the, the peak level of volatility, you know, ups and downs uh, of that exchange rate. Uh, compared, uh, which you see, is only comparable to the early part of that graph, which is the European monetary crisis of 1992. So we do have a lot of instability in the euro dollar exchange rate. Uh, that is, you can think of excess volatility that has to be corrected because this is non-functional. I mean, this is, serves no purpose really for the uh, for the global system. So this is the second, the third proposal on exchange rates. The fourth proposal on capital account uh, essentially say, well, let's think of, um, a, a, of a system in which not only you allow a capital account, but you somehow try to make those uh, restrictions uh, collectively uh, uh, coherent. Why is this a problem? Because when one country regulates capital, another country does not regulate capital, 
it's only transferring, in a sense, it's uh, transferring the excess money of the world to the other countries, to the countries that are not restricting capital. So in a sense, the intervening one place makes, rash, again, rationality for that country, but may not be a, a collective rationality. So the problems are, in a sense, displaced to other countries. And that's why I, I think uh, the issue of cross-border uh, finance has to come into the world agenda and give light to some rules of some sort, such as you know, many that may are actually being practiced by countries and that make uh, uh, some sense, uh, as the IMF itself has recognized. So I, you know, I propose, for instance, uh, uh, three uh, uh, possible uh, uh, to, to start the discussion uh, that I think are quite rational to adopt, which is allow for reserve requirements on, uh, on capital inflow. So uh, the system that was invented by Chile, that is practiced by Colombia and many other countries, uh, which is basically when you bring some capital into the country, you have to put some money in the, in the central bank. Okay? Uh, the second is establish minimum stay periods. So eliminate the volatility by saying, well, capital can come in, but it has to stay one year before you take it out. Okay? This is actually what the private sector does all the time. I mean, you bring money to a, to a fund, uh, they will tell you, yeah, you, bring the, you take the money out too soon, I'm going to cut you know, part of your money. You know? So you have the cost for getting out. So this is essentially what I'm proposing here. And the, and the third, and very importantly, is to eliminate certain uh, transactions. For instance, do not allow uh, uh, consumers who don't have uh, revenues uh, in foreign currencies to incur in, uh, in debt in foreign currencies, which is a typical problem. It has always generated problems in, in countries. I mean, the most recent in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, where many uh, consumers actually adopted the uh, 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 debts in, uh, in euros or other currencies, and uh, which has been a, a very uh, a, a source of problems. So that's a, a, another block of the, of the reform effort. Uh, the, um, then still another reform is how you do emergency financing. This is an area in which uh, many uh, good things have happened already, uh, and you have essentially uh, to continue on that. Uh, you know, among the things that um, that uh, have been adopted by the IMF in 2009 and 2007, we have the uh, that all facilities will double, that you have a contingency credit lines that is credit lines that you don't use necessarily, that you can, but uh, you can you know get a loan sort of an overdraft facility, right? That you get with your own banks, okay? So you have an overdraft facility, you have a capacity to a loan that you can use whenever uh, is needed uh, in the future. Uh, you have a, a, a new framework for low-income countries that was approved last year, uh, and the elimination of certain conditionalities uh, in IMF lending. But the problem uh, is that the system is still seen as insufficient because, as as in the, in the international debate, is still you know IMF borrowing still carries a stigma because it is the the uh, view that you know you go to the IMF because you have a problem, and on top of that you're going to have conditionalities of the IMF. And that's why I, I think this problem can only be solved by a sort of automatic uh, overdraft facility of some sort. So there is at least partial adoption of the reform that was suggested by Keynes in 1944. That is, create an overdraft facility that any country can use up to a limit uh, in a, without any conditionality of any sort, okay? And that, I think, uh, will eliminate, in a sense, the, the stigma because, you know, when a private firm or a consumer uses his overdraft facility is not seen as a stigma is uh, for uh, for borrowing. And finally, in the reform agenda, in the substantive reform agenda, we need uh, to solve the issue of debt resolution, uh, in which uh, again we have a non-system today, uh, a non-system that um, it has a, a, a well-structured mechanism, the Paris Club for uh, official debts, but you have nothing uh, really for private debts. Okay. So you have to think of, of a different system uh, in which uh, both public and private debts uh, are dealt with. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you can think of many mechanisms of this sort. Actually, the best try was done by the IMF uh, in uh, 2001, 2003, which is the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. That didn't work, among all reasons, uh, in opposition by different countries, by uh, the U.S., also some Latin American countries, Brazil and Mexico, opposed it, etc. So it didn't, uh, was not approved. 
but it was a, a very interesting try because, but it's also problematic for another reason because is you cannot give that the management of that mechanism to a creditor. The IMF is a creditor, it gives lending. So you cannot give you know, a lender the capacity to manage the debt restructuring because it has an interest in the result of that restructuring. Uh, and that's why you can think of, you have to think of different mechanisms. One is actually to create the debt restructuring mechanism within the, UN, in the United Nations. I think that's one thing that you know, uh, could be done. But the other is you want to give it, uh, give it to the IMF, which is you know, a thing that I have thought through the time, is uh, you can do it but through independent uh, panels uh, of, uh, that look at the problem of each individual country and try to give rationality. So something that is done with the WTO for trade disputes. So a similar mechanism to the trade disputes of WTO in which you, you know, when there is a, a problem of one country, then you create a panel that will uh, you know, uh, serve as a negotiating or help in the negotiations between uh, the debtors and creditors uh, and eventually reach a mechanism, and if it doesn't reach an agreement, it will decide on what agreement will take place. And that will be enforceable uh, in all uh, courts, okay? So, so those are the, the elements. I'll come back at the conclusion uh, to mention again. But these are the building blocks of this reform. Uh, now, let me finally give a, a few minutes to the issue of governance structures. Now, the, the governance structure, I think, has three elements that have to be taken into account. The first one, and the one that has been discussed more extensively, is reforming the Bretton Woods Institution to make them more representative of countries. And here, uh, as we know, the, the major problem uh, is the overrepresentation of Europe and the underrepresentation of Asia? I mean, to be uh, straight and simple, uh, and and that's the problem that has to be solved. The Asian economies are much more important today than when uh, the system of quotas of the IMF or the uh, uh, World Bank were were adopted. Uh, and so we have to give, uh, and, and the European economies, in turn, have the opposite problem. They are m much less important today. Uh, than when the system was adopted. And there are other problems. I mean, there are problems of, you know, uh, allowing that the election of the uh, IMF managing director and the World Bank should be, the uh, president of the World Bank should be free to any citizen, avoiding the, the tradition that the IMF managing director is a European and the president of the World Bank is an American, uh, which in practice means that there is no election uh, uh, as such, you know, the president of the World Bank is usually designated by the U.S. president, uh, and the uh, managing director of the uh, of the IMF is uh, selected by the finance ministers of Europe. That's that's how the system uh, functions. It's not a very democratic system. If we are you are a citizen from even Japan, you have no chance of being either. Okay, but not to say you are a Chinese or an Indian or a Brazilian or a Colombian. Okay, so you have no chance. And you have other problems, like the, uh, the fact that you have a, an 85% majority rule in the IMF, which means that the US, which has 18% quota, has a veto. It's the only country that has a veto. Of course, you can also have a veto of a collect, or collection of countries, and some countries get together and veto some decisions in the IMF. But the, the fact that the US has that majority by itself is a problem. Uh, and then there are other problems that I don't have the time to, to deal with. Now, the, the recent reform uh, is the most interesting reform uh, approved, the one that was decided before uh, the Seoul meeting of the G20 and approved by the IMF board, uh, which is, I think, the, a very, the most significant reform effort, and I think it's a major step in the right direction. What does it imply? Uh, well, first of all, it's different for quotas and for voting power. Basically because uh, the, the IMF does have a, a system which was improved two years ago by which each individual country independent of size is given a certain number of basic votes, right? Uh, so, it's, so the voting power is based on quota and those basic votes, okay? Now, in quota, what, what happened? Uh, the European uh, basically lost or uh, allow, uh, accepted to lose 4% of the quota, uh, which is given uh, to developing countries in, in uh, essentially, and particularly to China and four other, uh, uh, five other developing countries, uh, which are uh, 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 Korea, India, 
I mean, the Republic of Korea, India, uh, Brazil, Mexico, and Turkey. Okay? So those are the six winners of the reform. Okay? It's interesting that part of what they win, because China wins 3.4% and the other uh, five countries 3.9, part of that actually comes at the cost of other developing countries, 3.4%. Okay? So it's a, it's a problem. I mean, many countries lost, many developing countries lost in this negotiation, uh, including uh, important countries. South Africa, for instance, is one country that loses in the, in the negotiation. Importing power is actually better. Uh, developing countries win 5.3 percentage, and now the, uh, the uh, small, uh, the, uh, the non-six winners, let's say, are uh, lose uh, only 1.4 percent. Uh, and very interestingly, the low-income countries, which actually lose in quotas, 0.3 percent, uh, win slightly in terms of voting power because of the basic votes. Okay, so it's I, actually you know you can think of more reform. But this is really, a, a, has been a major effort, and, and I think this, so this area is taken care of. The World Bank was, al was also reformed this year in terms of, the, of its power, uh, voting power, which is also you know, a significant move. Both are insufficient, in my view, but they are significant uh, positive moves, and the fact that this is an area in which we are moving forward. But I would say the second issue, and the most basic, is how we manage this problem of elite multilateralism. So how we go from, from a, an institution that is self-appointed, non-representative of the whole world, and non-institutional, uh, which is the G20, into something that has a better and more institutional structure. So uh, my, my proposal in this area is that the world has to, I mean, starting by the G20 itself, has to start seriously thinking about a, 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 an institutional structure that is formal and that meets the objective that the G20 has done, the job that the G20 has done during this crisis, which has been positive. Okay? So the more I think of, of this, the, the more uh, I think that this uh, a structure has to have uh, two features. First of all, it has to be headed in the UN, but not in the UN organization, but in the UN system, including the World Bank and the IMF as members of the United Nations system. You know, a fact that they don't usually recognize, but it should be recognized. So you, you, you put them as part of the UN system. You bring the WTO into the UN system, which for funny reasons was not made part of the UN system. So you have a structure, a, 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 a sort of institutional structure to govern economic globalization, let's say, in the UN system, okay? So the, my, my proposal the, it will be that the, it will basically support, be supported by five organizations, which are the UN proper, the United Nations Organization, the World Bank, the IMF, WTO, and ILO, to take a major uh, specialized agency of the UN system. So that's the, the essence of the reform. And the second problem, the second issue of that, it has to be based on a system that allows the most significant countries to be on the table, but on elected basis. So you don't, no country has the right by itself to be on the table. By, so you have to think of a system in which, uh, let's say, the, the importance, the economic importance of countries is recognized for the membership of, of uh, but at the same time, all countries are represented, and that's why, at the end, I think we have to think of a constituency system, very much like the IMF and the World Bank uh, function. So in which, let's say, my country, Colombia, never sits on the IMF board, uh, but it's part of the constituency headed by Brazil. So Colombia, uh, like Philippines, which is also part of that constituency, uh, speaks through Brazil in the IMF board. So, but we have a voice, an indirect voice, but we have a voice. So we have to think of something, which is, a, of course, a very different institution for the United Nations, because it will, ha it will recognize two points, the fact that you, know, you have a UN system, but you also have different sizes of countries that you have to recognize, because it is quite clear that you have a, a, an organization of that in which the major powers are not sitting on the table, then 
the decisions of that body will not be taken into account by the powerful countries. I mean, which is the reality uh, which has been recognized at the end in the creation of elite multilateralism. So you have to think of something that is really a replacement of elite multilateralism by true multilateralism uh, uh, through uh, something organized around the United Nations system. And the third element which I propose is what I call a multi-layer uh, architecture, uh, which is essentially a system in which you recognize that you, you don't, not only need world institutions, but you, you have a dense network of regional institutions, okay, and sub-regional institutions, and maybe inter-regional institutions, okay, which is what we have today in the world for the for the for multilateral development banks. Because in multilateral development bank, we have the World Bank, but we have the African, the Asian, Inter-American development banks. And we have several sub-regional banks. You know, in Latin America, we have three. Uh, we have uh, the Andean Development Corporation. We have the, uh, the Central American Integration Bank. We have the Caribbean Development Bank. Uh, and then we even have inter-regional banks, the most important being the Islamic Development Bank. So you have a system in which you have many institutions that are supporting. Uh, now, my idea is, let's do the same for the IMF. So let's think of a system in which, aside from the IMF, we have regional institutions that support, that are part of one system. Uh, and I think the two major steps are, are of course, the Chiang Mai Initiative of Asia, um, you know, ASEAN plus uh, China, Republic of Korea, and Japan, uh, the Latin American Reserve Fund, uh, and uh, very interestingly, the, the recent European agreements on their own uh, monetary architecture. So those are the three elements. So uh, let me conclude then by, by saying that the, the reform effort has to have uh, two basic elements, what I call a comprehensive uh, yet evolutionary reform, uh, which is made essentially of five uh, elements, which is, I have presented uh, one by one. You have to have an IMF-centered macroeconomic consultation process. So you replace the G20 by the IMF at the center of the system. Second, you have a, a new reserve system basically based on, uh, on the special drawing rights. Third, you, you rebuild an exchange rate system in the ways I, I, I suggested. You have a, a broader use with some international rules on capital accounts regulations, so you put cross-border finance as part of financial regulation, and four, you create an international debt workout mechanism. So those are the five building blocks, let's say, the reform effort. And you need an inclusive architecture, which in my view requires three things. First, the continuing the reform of the Bretton Woods institutions. Second, uh, replace elite multilateralism uh, by a UN system organization. Uh, and finally, uh, a multilayer multi architecture with active participation of regional institutions. Thank you very much.